Celtic. This year we are reuniting the 1938 Shadow cast plus members of later years of the Shadow. Uh, we hope to have shortly uh, Dwight Wiest, Margot Stevenson, and Trudy Warner joining us. Uh, the members of the panel at this time consist of, on my far right, your left, Ken Roberts. Hi. Ken Roberts was the announcer on The Shadow uh, for over half of the series run. Uh, he started as the announcer in 1931 on the Blue Coal Radio Review, uh, continued with The Shadow, of which that was the second season following the Detective Story magazine, continued on several seasons opposite Frank Reddick, and for a brief period, Jimmy Lacurto, when Jimmy Lacurto filled in. Uh, then when Orson Welles began playing The Shadow as Lamont Cranston in 1937, Ken Roberts was the announcer. He is, as far as I know, the only person to have worked with all the major shadows. Uh, Frank Reddick, Jr., uh, Jimmy Lacurto, Orson Welles, Bill Johnstone, Brett Morrison, and John Archer. Did you work with uh, Steve Courtley when he took over? For, okay. Uh, he worked with John Archer on Quick as a Flash, his own show, which he created. You created Quick as a Flash, didn't you? Uh, which featured uh, radio detectives as part of the game. Next to me is Sidney Sloan, or is Sloan, it Sloan? Sloan. Sidney Sloan, I'm Spells sorry. Uh, who was an actor on The Shadow during the Orson Welles and Bill Johnstone periods, and then became a writer and wrote a couple dozen of the Shadow radio shows, and you also served as script editor, didn't you? Not on that show. No, later when I worked for uh, Ruth Roth and Ryan, I did. After all, I wrote more than a couple of dozen Shadows. I don't know how many I wrote. I was just trying to count them in here. First one was the Phantom Fingerprints. Mm -hmm. I, may I say something about that? Sure. I was an actor on the show, and I was writing for other shows on radio, and. Uh, Bill Tuttle, who was directing the show, came to me after rehearsal. We hadn't started, we hadn't gone on the air yet. He said to me, hey, don't you think this is a terrific script? And at the risk of never being hired by Bill again, I said, no, I don't think it's, I think it's a rather hackneyed idea, and it's been done, it'll go very well, but it's been done by other people. And Bill said, well, if you can write a better script, why don't you write one? Which I did, and finally wrote it for five years. Uh, not all the time, but I wrote five years of, uh, I was in, employed uh, with other things too, but that uh, was quite a nice thing for me. Uh, just to continue in the introductions, on my left, your right, is Walter Gibson, the man who in a very real sense created the shadow, the author of 283 shadow novels, uh, the man who created Lamont Cranston and Commissioner Weston and Joe Cardona and Clyde Burke and other characters who appeared on the radio show. On the far end is Mr. John Manavik, Walter's unseen partner in the preparation of the Shadow Magazine stories. John Manavik was the editor during the glory days of The Shadow, Doc Savage, Nick Carter, and The Avenger, and was a very important, also was a coordinator of uh, the pulp magazine's relations with the radio show. You okayed the radio scripts. And yep, that was my job. I didn't know anything about it. <laughs> uh, I'll explain later. <laughs> if, if I may go back to Ken Roberts for just a moment. You worked with, as I said, virtually every shadow. Which of the, uh, how would you describe Frank Reddick as the shadow? Because none of his shows exist. Well, Frank actually was the shadow long before there was a Lamont Cranston. When Frank was doing the shadow, the shadow was, I shouldn't say nothing more or less, because he was a very important part of the show, actually. But what he was, more than anything, was a narrator. He was the signature voice. He was the voice whom you heard saying, who knows what evil lurks in the hearts of men, and all of the other well-known phrases. And it was also the role of the shadow to set the scene of 
the story you are about to hear. And, of course, he was marvelous at what he did. And very often, uh, when he dropped his shadow voice, he would become an actor in the scripts as well. I, I should mention Frank Reddick, who, by the way, played the part of Carl Phillips in the Orson Welles uh, War of the Worlds broadcast, a very pivotal role in that show, the newsman who was killed midway through the show. Frank Reddick was a very understated actor, in many ways the antithesis of Orson Welles. Orson Welles who gives these larger-than-life performances. Frank Reddick was a wonderfully understated actor who really let it all out when he played The Shadow. The Shadow was the one role where he overacted, if anything. And when Radio Daily reviewed Orson Welles' first Shadow radio show, they complained that Wells' portrayal was just not up to his predecessor. <laughs> they suggested, however, that with a bit of practice and if he learns a few mic tricks, he may be acceptable in the role. <laughs> now that makes you wonder how good Frank Reddick was <laughs> when Orson Welles is compared unfavorably with him. Or, or, or how good the critic was. Right. <laughs> <laughs> a good <job. laughs> Walter? You were at, was it Thurston's house or Dunninger's when you first heard a detective story hour? We were at Thurston's. And I was incidentally over there on a radio. I was over there on a radio deal. Thurston, the magician, wanted to get into radio. And I was thinking of plot ideas. We were going to make sort of a magical uh, detective type of thing. And uh, this is before I'd written The Shadows. But I'd been doing writing for such magazines and strange stories and uh, I was familiar with uh, the general things needed for a program like that. I'd been ghosted for Thurston on simple trick books. And uh, so I was over there and we were turning on the radio to hear different programs. And one came on, it was, uh, it was the detective story hour. And uh, so we heard the narrator playing the part of the shadow. And uh, the narrator introduced himself as the shadow. And uh, I, the, the thing held in abeyance, curiously, I was still getting word from Thurston. I came over to see a man, a writer named Innes Osborne, who was a playwright and had been doing material for um, the uh, uh, New York's New Haven Railroad had a uh, story, a running thing at that time. And I was thinking of getting into radio, but just then came word that they needed a, 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 a shadow character. Street and Smith wanted to have somebody write a character story about the shadow in order to protect it. And so that's how I got my job, as to writing a quarterly. Now, in the second shadow novel, The Shadow Laughs, Walter Gibson introduced the character of Lamont Cranston. Now, Walter was always a master of misdirection, but in the third novel, Walter revealed that the shadow was not really Cranston, that there was a re another Lamont Cranston. Once again, as in all of Walter's novels, nothing is ever what it seems to be. And eventually, after giving clues for about 120 novels, Walter revealed that the shadow was really... Ken Allard, a aviator who had flown down to Yucatan and then come back to play the part of Cranston. But he wanted to fly down there so that nobody, they thought after so many years, he suddenly came back from the jungle with some natives. And presumably he lived down there all that time so he couldn't possibly have been the shadow. <laughs> uh, by the way, Walter's first chapter, uh, the chapter in The Shadow Lasts, with the real Cranston is beautifully entitled, Lamont Cranston Talks to Himself. <laughs> what happened was this. Uh, Cranston woke up in bed, and somebody's leaning over the foot of the bed. And he looks up and sees himself there. And that's when it was the shadow. And the shadow said, I think you ought to take another trip to Timbuktu or somewhere. And Cranston says, what do you mean? He said, well, I play your part when you leave this nice mansion and go abroad, why that enables me to make my headquarters here. And I'm fighting crime and I need the, uh, to, to be you for a while. Well, Cranston was kind of intrigued, but 
uh, he began to say, now wait a minute, just suppose we had a showdown on this. And the shadow said, that would be excellent. He said, I'm going to ask you a few questions about your parentage and family and everything. And he asked the questions, and Cranston couldn't answer most of them. And the shadow said, I know them all. If we both came into a court of law, they would decide that I was Lamar Cranston and not you. <laughs> As I remember, uh, the shadow had also altered the records of Cranston's signature and fingerprints. That's right. <laughs> nice fellow that he was. <laughs> Cranston said, this is a great idea. He was very pleased with the chance to go abroad and so forth. But there's one peculiar thing that came later. Um, after that, we just buried that under for, for years until we brought Allard in. And, uh, but the curious thing was that a lot of the readers, when the radio came in, we began using Margot Lane in the shadow stories. Prior to that, we had had different heroines in each novel because you know, we tried to make the novels quite different. And uh, so we found many stories, particularly the Houdinic type, where Margot figured nicely. But some of the readers began to say, no, Margot Lane isn't as snappy as some of the other agents of the shadow and so forth and so on. And they were kind of crazy. How did he ever happen to pick her? Well, the way he picked her was, she went on a cruise, and the real Cranston was on the cruise, and she meets the real Cranston, who says, well, I'm staying at the Cobalt Club, but he was away when she came back, and the shadow was up there as Cranston, so that's how she got linked up with the shadow. And the, 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 the readers all loved that. <laughs> we had a lot of fun with it. John, what were your duties in coordinating the radio scripts of the shadow? Oh, they were tremendous. <laughs> When Street and Smith sold the rights and sold somebody for so the shadow on the air, I think at two hundred or one hundred dollars a week, that was a fortune because it was fun money. So somebody had to control it, supposedly, and since I had the shadow and it was a shadow, that was my job. Every week Born Ruth Rock was to give me the script and I was to uh, well the terms weren't specific to okay or approve or or just forget it, you know. Well, Bourne was a pretty smart guy, uh, and about 40 years later, he came to Cudmere, where I was then, as, as VP of Public Relations, and he would send the script down to me about 3 o'clock Friday afternoon, which was all right, except I wanted to catch the Lehigh Valley train to my hometown near Allentown at 4.15, and that didn't give me much time to read the script. So I would just say, well, okay, besides, uh, I didn't know anything about radio. I had hardly ever listened to radio before this. I was in the magazine and writing business. That I knew, I thought, better than uh, the average person. But the radio, I didn't care. The only time, every now and then, besides, the show was doing real well, so why should I criticize the script? You know, you couldn't get anything better. Except every now and then we get, now here's a good example. I get the script and here was, the, the story was this, here was Joe, whose brother was in Sing Sing. And his brother was going to be hung at 6 o'clock tomorrow morning. Look at that as a born, you don't hang in Sing Sing. In New York, you electrocute. And you don't get that midnight flickering because that's on a separate circuit and so forth. This I know because each year I took the writers up there when Warden Laws was there. Remember, we'd go through the whole works. And uh, so that's no good. And second, this guy is up on top of the Salmon Tower, which is at 42nd and 5th Avenue, that sort of small skyscraper. And he's going to shoot the governor of the state. If they hang his brother, he's going to shoot the governor of the state, who is leading a parade down 5th Avenue. Mm -hmm. well, six o'clock in the morning, the governor is leading a parade down 5th Avenue. I said, Born. He said, look, and he was right in this, and other radio writers have told me this, too. First of all, in the radio, you can turn back the pages. In a story, if you pull a boner, they turn back the pages and you pull a boner. In radio, it's gone. There's nothing you can do about it. Second, they don't care what happened before. They just do this and that. I said, well, more, you're going to get bushels of letters. He said, look, if I get more than four letters, I'll buy you and I the best dinner in the uh, Cloud Club. That was the Ruth Ryan and Ryan had their office in the Chrysler building. And this was a private club on the top. I said, OK. Well, he got three letters, but we got the dinner anyway. I wouldn't let him get anything. <laughs> but that was my, my liaison between Street and Smith and the uh, agency. Uh, later years, 
I did get more involved, and so did Walt. We would argue about some points, and uh, so we had some influence on it. But basically, they knew their business, and uh, we didn't try to upset the apple cart, as long as everybody was happy about it. And uh, so, over the years, the relationship between Street and Smith and Ruth, Roth, and Ryan were excellent. The only other incident was one year the show was canceled, at least Blue Coal canceled it, and our promotion man was uh, Eddie Columbus. What is that his last name? Do you remember? I tried to think of it. No. The Colum he was related to the Smiths, and he was a Columbia graduate. He came right from school. So we call him Columbia Eddie. That was a, he was a good promotion man, and uh, he made up a presentation to sell the shadow to somebody else, anybody else. And he went to one prospect and came back and said, you know, one thing they sort of gave me a strong hint. Why, how did Blue Coal like it? Why did they quit? You know. I said, well, okay. Why don't you get a letter from Blue Coal saying why they quit and how much they liked the program? He said, I don't know if I can get a letter from him. I said, okay, we wrote the letter. Boy, we wrote a damn good letter from why Blue Coal liked the show and they had to leave it for something like that. So he took this down with the presentation to have Blue Coal approve it. We, thought we wouldn't use them often. Came back, he said, they bought the show. <laughs> I think they read their own letter and they said, well, we were that good, we bought it. So that was basically my relationship with the shadow on the air. Uh, Street and Smith had a very interesting situation on the shadow. Blue Coal paid for the production of the show through Ruth, Roth, and Ryan and aired it over 22 or 29 stations on the East Coast. Street and Smith, however, had the rights to air the show, sell the show to uh, other stations through Charlie Mickelson around the country. And because of this, Street and Smith ended up making over $100,000 a year during the 40s. I've seen the contracts. And licensing fees, because Blue Coal was sponsored over 22 or 29 shows or stations, and Kerry Salt over 100, and Bomb Bar or Grove Labs over 100, and then the Don Lee Pacific Coast Network, and they made much more money than if they had had one nationwide network sponsor. Uh, another interesting thing, in the very first Orson Welles shadow script, Harry Vincent figures fairly prominently. You can read that part in the Shadow Scrapbook. Uh, that script was written by Ed Hale Beardstadt with some input from Walter. Uh, the agency rewrote the script and changed Harry Vincent into Margot Lane. <laughs> For several reasons. A, unlike the misogynistic uh, anti-female audiences of the pulp magazine, uh, no, really? Okay. No, no, that's all wet. There are no anti -pe We had as, not as many. I bet we had one third of our readers were female. So where do the people get this crap? This is constantly <laughs> Well, we uh, had to have voice contrast. We right. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't hear about that. I mean, in the magazines, we had as, not as many, but about one third of our readers were girls or women. Okay, I stand corrected. And that was a good proportion. Well, wasn't that first script run as, as in the book? In the book, but... It was, uh, according to the reviews, no, Margo was rewritten, was written into that first episode. Those may be the changes that Ed Beerstead objected to. Probably. <laughs> but Margo was very likely uh, named after Margo Stevenson, mm -hmm. who did, was doing a lot of work for Ruth Roth and Ryan at that time, and uh, was very friendly with several of the people at Ruth Roth and Ryan. Uh, Ken. Yes. Getting back to you. Oh, by the way, I'd like to introduce one more person. Dick Osgood is standing over there. He's the one sinking slowly to the ground. <laughs> Dick Osgood was in the very first season of The Shadow, the Detective Story Hour, with Jimmy Lacurto and Frank Reddick. In fact, he remembered last year that he was somewhat disappointed when Reddick got the role because uh, he wanted to try out for it himself. But uh, Dick was known as Elmer Cornell back in those days. Uh, Let me tell you a moment about it. Edward Hale Bierstadt. Edward Hale Bierstadt was a very competent writer and he had written, the reason they picked him was he had written the Warden Laws program which was a successful thing on the air. And 
what John was saying about the hanging and everything, Ed Bierstadt was a stickler for all those things. And uh, he had written some books on famous trials and another book based on Jack the Ripper. He had quite a, a literary career, career behind him. And he um, was married to Catherine McKenzie, who was on the staff of the New York Times and had written the biography, an authentic biography of Alexander Graham Bell because she had been his secretary. And they were summering at Shabib, Shabib Island in Casco Bay. And I was on, lived inland at Gray, Maine for 15 miles. So I got notification to go down and meet the writer that was doing the radio script. I went down, went on a boat called the Nellie G, which was quite a boat. We got over there and we stayed there so long that uh, uh, both Jim and I, or both uh, Ed Beer's dad and I had a certain penchant for scotch, and so we got very chummy, and I liked the script, and <coughs> hoped he would go on with more. But he was a stickler for so many things that uh, when he began to, they began to tell him a few things and change his script, he just quit cold, and uh, that was the end of that. But I knew him in later years, and he used to come back to Shabig every summer, and, has some very interesting anecdotes about him. He fell down one uh, one summer and bro broke his leg. And it happened on a Saturday, and nobody came to the house until Monday. The wife didn't get there for the weekend, and the, the maid came in to clear up the place and immediately called the local doctor. They have a doctor on the uh, place, uh, on the island, and uh, he temporarily put some board, some split type of things on his leg and said, this man can't navigate any other way. You've got to get him to the Portland Hospital. So they had to carry, carry him. When they came the taxi driver came. Now they had to carry him. They picked up the cot bodily with four men and carried it on the boat. And he came into Portland Harbor, and by that time, they sent me a phone call out of Maine. And this understands a year after. And it had nothing to do with the shadow all that year, but we made a very interesting friendship. He's a likable guy, and despite his eccentricities. And uh, so he stayed at my house and recuperated for all that summer. And uh, you know what? When I, I knocked out some shadow stories, and having him with nothing else to do and wanted to read them, boy, I really put stuff into those stories. It was great having a reader of his capability just sitting around there. And uh, the interesting thing was the bills came in from Shabig Island. And you know what it cost him to be taken from that house in the middle of the island instead of by the roadway where the taxi cab was carried by four men, one of them the taxi driver, about a half mile or so across fields, 75 cents, because that was the charge for the taxi cab. <laughs> Their way of thinking up there was that somebody, you came to get somebody in the taxi cab, it was your business to get them, to get them where they were going, whether they could use the cab or not. So it was just right from the sidelights. The shadow cast of the Orson Welles and Bill Johnstone eras they will learn differently. was probably the greatest cast that ever existed on the show. You had Orson and Bill, Ray Collins, and Dwight Wiest as Weston, later Kenny Delmar, Ken Roberts' cousin, Everett Sloan. Everett? No. Was he, he, Everett? He was related to me. Yes. Weren't you his cousin? No, Everett was married to my cousin. Oh, okay. I stand corrected once again. That's perfectly all right. Uh, Arthur Benton. Uh, Roland Winters. Oh, Roland Winters? That's right, it? yes. Roland was uh, on the cast from time to time. He, he, of course, in case you don't know who Roland Winters is, went on to become Charlie Chan. In the films. In films. And uh, has just lately retired as president of the Players Club in New York, so actors think very highly of him. Okay, could you two talk a little bit about the people you knew and anecdotes about the show during that period? Well, the most interesting anecdote, I think, to the people present today would be the story of Orson Welles' uh, sojourn as Lamont Cranston, in the sense that when Orson was invited to do 
the shadow. He was then starting what was to become a very great career, of course. And uh, he was very active as the director of the Mercury Theater here in New York. And he had his own stock company of players, and they did an active repertory season on Broadway for a few years. And he hardly had time to do anything except his own Mercury Theater work. When prevailed upon to do The Shadow, he did so on one condition. <laughs> 